Welcome. Thank you for participating in this webinar, which will be about autoacoustic emissions. My name is Jos. I am one of the audiologists and clinical trainers at Introacoustics. The learning objectives today are as follows. We would like to explain how comes that the ear is uh, capable of producing sound, because autoacoustic emissions is the sound that we can record coming out of the ear. Then we want to explain what we can conclude from these measurements. So what, what does it mean if a OAE is present? There is two methods of measuring OAEs currently, uh, distortion product OAEs and transient evoked OAEs. So we will explain uh, the, the technology behind it. And then lastly, we will talk about the differences between the two and if those differences are relevant in order to prefer one over the other one. Let's start with the physiology of the ear. Here we see an ear canal with the middle ear and a cochlea attached to it. And right now you see a sound going into the uh, cochlea. And if it were a very low frequency tone, then it would end up completely at the end of the cochlea. When looking at the cochlea, it's basically a tube which is rolled up. If you roll it out and and, and, and you take a, a um, cross section at, at, at one of the points, then you would see the picture that is now shown at the top right. Right here and at the bottom here, these are the two main canals, so to say, which are filled with liquids. And the, the vibration that, uh, the sound vibration that propagates through the, through the cochlea cause the membrane that is here in the middle to vibrate. If we zoom in a little bit further, then we can see that in that membrane, we, we have a row of inner hair cells and we have three rows of outer hair cells. And this is the inner hair cells that uh, uh, gets activated by the vibrations and that sends signals over the nerve towards the brain. Now, how does this work? First, I would like to show you a nice website if correct on your screen, it, uh, it, it would now show an animation where we see again on the left hand side the, 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 the eardrum and the middle ear and then we see the, the, the cochlea, we see the cross section basically in, in, in the other direction. The idea is that uh, uh, the pattern you see here is the movement that occurs when a pure tone is being uh, presented to the ear. If we look at it this way, we see the we see the same cross section again. Right here, you see the envelope of the movement of the basilar membrane. Now, what does that mean for the, the activity in the inner hair cells? If we look at the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells from the top, there they are. Then, due to the vibration, there will be activity generated. Um, if it was only uh, the physiology of the ear that, that, that would be uh, causing the activation, then there would be uh, quite a few hair cells, inner hair cells, that get activated in a similar amount. So, so they fire with, a, uh, uh, well, with similar strength towards the brain. And this means that for the brain, it is not clear which one of these is now actually representing the, the very precise pure tone that is presented. So what happens in the ear is that the outer hair cells, they start uh, uh, contracting, they start moving with the exact same frequencies that are presented. Um, I made an animation of that. But it is causing the basal membrane to move more around the position where the exact frequency should be located. And what we now see is that uh, there is, uh, well, in my example, I made one of the hair cells being activated clearly more than the rest. And the brain now clearly gets information about that it is this pure tone that is being heard. Now, the help of these outer hair cells, this movement, it's a vibration, of course, and the vibration generates sound. And this tone that is being created, that is what the autoacoustic emission is. This tone uh, uh, comes out of the ear through, through it, it travels uh, back over the basal membrane through the uh, middle ear and, and in the ear canal you can measure 
that uh, autoacoustic emissions are coming out of the ear. Now, there are two ways to do this, to measure autoacoustic emissions, and let's first look at the transient evoked OAEs. Um, we take the same ear canal, the same model, and we put a probe inside the ear canal. Now, with transient evoked OEs, we present a click stimulus. And a click stimulus is a sound that contains many frequencies at the same time, which in this picture I, I, I kind of represented by, by these three uh, sinus waveforms. Now, as soon as the click is sent towards uh, the cochlea, they all travel with the same speed, which you can see that when they cause an OAE to appear, and let's repeat this animation, due to the travel time in the cochlea, the OAEs from the different frequencies come out of the ear at a different time. So if we put this into a graph, here we see a timeline, and, and if vertically we see the, the intensity of the stimulus and also the, the OAEs that come out, then first uh, we present a stimulus, and then in time after the stimulus is gone, we, we measure which OAEs are coming out of the ear. There is a small problem with that. One problem is that it contains noise, acoustical noise, and the other problem is that our stimulus is reflecting at all the surfaces that it meets on the way in. So it re reflects at the eardrum, at the different bones, and it also reflects uh, uh, at the basilar membrane, you could say. So what to do to, to get rid of these uh, uh, problems? Firstly, we can repeat the presentation many times. By repeating uh, many times and then looking at an average, you eliminate noise. But you do not eliminate reflections. Um, to eliminate reflections, there is a smart trick, which is based on the linearity of uh, acoustics. What we can do is we can present another click that is three times the intensity, otherwise exactly the same, and then um, um, by adding all the responses together, these four responses together, all the reflections in this will sum up to be zero. What, what happens in the cochlea, what happens when producing autoacoustic emissions is that the, the, the OAE of a louder sound is not three times as big as the OAE, uh, as, as the OAE from the uh, uh, softer sound. And because the OAEs are nonlinear, you, you can take the sum of these res responses and it will not be zero. And the, the part that is not zero, that is in fact the autoacoustic emission. Let, let's switch over to DPOE. We take the same model, we put the probe in the ear. Um, DPOE stands for distortion product OAE. Uh, what we do is we present two tonal stimuli at the same time. Because they are constantly playing, we will see on the basal membrane that there is these envelopes uh, surrounding the two places where uh, the tones are played. Let's look at this picture in a slightly different way. This time you don't see the timeline horizontally, but this is frequency. And notice that in the graphic below, we put low frequencies on the left and high frequencies on the, on the right. Now, we present two tones. There are uh, uh, a 10 dB difference in loudness. And uh, these, these two tones, they cause the basal membrane to be activated uh, in a certain, uh, with a certain pattern. In the area where these two overlap, uh, the outer hair cells react on both tones. And while they do that, they produce not only the sound from the two tones, they also produce a distortion product. We find the, the OAE frequency here at the position where the distance between the OAE and F1 is exactly the same distance as the, the distance between the two stimuli. And not only this frequency is generated by uh, the outer hair cells, it's also the harmonics of that frequency, but those are typically much smaller and they might disappear in the noise very easily. So when we analyze distortion product OAEs, because this is a distortion product, then, then we look at the frequency which is calculated by taking two times the frequency one minus one time frequency two. We're going to swap over to 
software. I'm going to do a couple of uh, TOE measurements first, and then the DPOE measurements. And I need to put my headphone a little bit strange on my head, so there is room for the probe to go into my ear. So the probe is now put into my ear. I will start the measurement, and of course, during the measurement, I will remain completely quiet. Okay, I uh, stopped the measurement myself. This was a measurement uh, that would only stop if all bands that are being measurement, measured uh, uh, result in sufficient OAE. And we can see that at, uh, at the 5 kilohertz band, the, the OAE level, which is uh, indicated by the red bar, um, uh, would not come above the minimum level, which is required, which is at uh, minus 10 minus 10 dB SPL. So uh, um, the bottom graph is the most important graph where we look at results, where the gray is the noise floor. Then on top of that, we see an OAE, and, and it indicates a signal to noise ratios, which is quite large. Uh, in practice, 6 dB is uh, required for a, a pass, you could say, for a single band. Um, I also want you to, to have a look at the top graph where it says stimulus and probe check. Um, the stimulus is showing the click stimulus. We see, uh, we see a movement up and down and then a little bit of ringing after that. It's quite important that it gets silent relatively fast because around four milliseconds we, we will start doing uh, the recording. The, the, the graph in the middle shows the response waveform, but it also basically shows that from four to 12 and a half milliseconds, we have our recording window. And the two traces in the graph, they show the OAE measurement as function uh, of time, while the bottom graph shows the OAE measurement as function of frequency. The top right where it says probe check, we see how, uh, how the click was presented into the ear. And the more flat this graph is, the better. Sometimes you see that, uh, that there is a dip uh, at the higher frequencies due to the positioning of the probe. Uh, let's redo the measurement but now using a screening protocol just to see how that would go. There we go. Okay. It took four seconds. That's a number we should remember, uh, maybe as a reference when we do the DPOE test. In this case, a pass uh, was defined as all four bands having sufficiently big OAEs. Some countries, they do four. In other countries, they do four out of five. Sometimes it's three out of four bands. Move over to the DPOE. With the DPOE test, I also will first do a protocol where, uh, where we're not doing a pass refer test. Let's just start. I'll be silent for about a minute and then talk about what we see on the screen. Okay. Everywhere where we see a green check mark, it means that the signal to noise ratio was uh, good enough, higher than uh, 60 dB. 
It also means that the OAE level was above the minimum required level, which is here set at the dotted line, minus 10 dB. Um, and it also means that the reliability is quite high. Uh, it, I put the reliability at 99%. Uh, this means that it is 99% sure that the OAE is not accidentally part of the noise. And we see one point at 8,000 hertz where there is a different symbol, this measurement stopped because the noise became so low that it's unlikely uh, uh, that, that we will find an OAE with such a low noise already, uh, so, so it wouldn't spend more time on that either. And if we look at the top graph, this is where we see the, the two stimuli, F1 and F2, and then on the left we see the, the red bar indicating where the OAE uh, is being found, and when this OAE bar is high enough over the rest of the noise that we can see, then it indicates an OAE. Let's also repeat uh, the test here with uh, a screening test. Um, the screening test can be done in a with a screening view where you where you only see that it's busy, and then you see the pass uh, or refer. But I like to show you the graphs today. So let's see how this works. Okay. Now we use two seconds. Um, this, the screening with DPOE, uh, typically in different countries, it's set up to, to give a pass if you have three out of four OAEs present. Um, it, uh, it didn't continue measuring the fourth because it already got to the... Uh, cut this after the first three, but I believe that even if it measured the fourth, then it would still be under the time of the TOE, which was uh, four seconds time. Um, so we can see that the DPOE can also be quite quick. And now we uh, get to the topic of the clinical values of OEs. Um, first of all, I like to have said that the outcome of a OAE uh, the interpretation is quite independent of if it was measured with DPOE or TOE. If we take, for example, this patient, uh, I picked a baby because it's a, it's a classic example of a patient uh, where where you can only work with objective measurements. Um, if if we look at uh, what the OAE was measuring, here we have the cochlea and the cross section of the cochlea, and we've learned that. OAE says something about outer hair cell movement. So the presence of autoacoustic emissions indicates that there is outer hair cell functions. Now, so basically, if the OAE results in a pass, we say there is good outer hair cell functions. Um, we also say if there is a pass, that there must be a free pathway from the outer ear towards the cochlea. If there would be some middle ear problem or outer ear problem, then firstly, the stimulus couldn't reach the cochlea properly, and secondly, the OE couldn't travel back towards the probe. So, so with small defects on the way, you would already see that the OE uh, might disappear. Um, it is all based on outer hair cell function, so we do not get information about inner hair cells, and we also do not get information about how the acoustic nerve is working. Um, on uh, normal healthy patients, we consider this not at all a risk because the, the, the you know, statistically inner hair cell function and uh, neurological problems doesn't appear so much. So, it, so in screening programs, uh, uh, we, we are only careful with using OEs if there is an indication that the baby uh, uh, might suffer from more complicated uh, things. And this means that babies that have been in the neonatal care, the neonatal intensive care units, they will not be screened with uh, OAE. Now, o OAE has a um, similar function on adults. It, it, um, uh, it's just more used on children, but um, if you need an objective measurement to prove that the hearing is uh, normal or close to normal, then you can uh, use an OAE at uh, all ages. Um, if your OAE result is not satisfactory, if you did not find any OAEs, then you have to be very careful with making conclusions. You, you have to be capable of making a good interpretation of the, the details of the measurement, uh, of the, 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 the stimulus that was being used, if it was correctly uh, presented. 
generally speaking, you, uh, uh, a quick conclusion from not having an OAE is that the test is inconclusive. Let's compare the two methods of measuring autoacoustic emissions. Um, when doing so, I always like to refer to uh, uh, which stimuli I used, uh, because uh, due to the technology, some of the differences can be understood. Well, let's start by telling how, how equal they are. Um, if we look at the range of 1500 hertz to 4000 hertz, they both are uh, very nice to use. They are very good to use. There's not a big difference, you could say. You can also say that at 500 hertz, they are both quite poor. Uh, the reason is that at 500 hertz, uh, there is more noise and it's very difficult to get a proper OAE large enough, uh, larger than the noise. Now, where do they differ? TP OAE is better above 4000 hertz and TE OAE is better below 1000 hertz. Now, that DP OAE is better above 4000 hertz is, is because uh, presenting the two frequencies is relatively easily done and the intensity of those frequencies is relatively easily corrected in the ear canal where with TOE you are dependent on, on how the, the shape of the total click can be presented and as you can see in the example here here you can see that uh, there is a resonance dip at a certain frequency and at the higher frequencies the uh, the intensity is maybe not high enough to generate a proper OAE. Also, the, the, the technology from TEOE requires that the click is very, very reproducible. It means that if you present it three times it's, uh, the, the initial size, that has to be done very precise. And in the high frequencies, this is more difficult to do. And therefore, those, can be, uh, those cannot be measured as easily as uh, TEOE can be measured in high frequencies. Now, the, the reason why TEOE works better below 1000 hertz is partly due to, um, to uh, how we label the frequencies. Um, if you measure a frequency at 1000 hertz, as an example for TEOE, then you're looking at the frequency band around 1000 hertz. So the label really corresponds to the frequency where you're measuring. If you look at the OAE, which is at... Uh, thousand hertz with DPOE, then um, actually it's the it's the F2 frequency that is thousand hertz. So if F2 is thousand hertz, then the F1 is 818 hertz and the actual frequency where we are analyzing or measuring is 635 hertz. 635 hertz is already so much lower that it is much more affected by the noise around it so it becomes more difficult to measure it but by the way if you wonder which of these frequencies act is actually representing uh, the part of the vessel membrane that is being tested with EPOE then then it is certainly not the frequency that we measure so so if a thousand hertz is the label we measure at 635 but actually the the, the the area of the bezel or membrane that, that is being investigated is the area where there is overlap between activity from the F1 and the F2. So you could say b between the F1 and F2 frequencies, that part of the bezel or membrane is being analyzed by DPOE. Okay, ba back to the comparison. The last points to be made. Um, for DPOE, it is said that it saves time in noisy situations. The reason is that if you have acoustical noise and you present these two pure tones, then the noise is only really affecting the measurement very strongly if the noise is in, in uh, around the frequencies where you are in, uh, where you're doing your measurement. It's uh, um, DPOE is relatively insensitive to 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 noise, you could say, where. Um, TOE is measuring all frequencies at once, and because you analyze it per band, it's more affected by noise. Um, on the other hand, for TOE, it is said that it will save you time in quiet situations, and the reason for that is that you get all frequencies at the same time, so perhaps that gives you a quicker result. Though, with my little demonstration, I've already shown that new technology behaves a little bit different. Um, Nowadays, the, the frequency analysis of the 
DPOE measurement is done so quickly, the proof that an OAE is, is, is significantly different from the rest of the noise is, is, is done so quickly that actually doing the DPOE measurement uh, be became so much quicker that this advantage of TOE, in my opinion, doesn't really exist anymore. So I put a question mark behind that point. This means that we get to a summary. Remember from this webinar is that the ear generates sounds which we can measure outside, and those are caused by outer hair self uh, uh, movements. Then, as a clinical benefit, I would like you to remember that OAE is a good objective measurement to find a strong indication if normal or almost normal hearing is present. And then lastly, if we look at the different technologies, DPOE or TOE, which one should we prefer? Well, it depends a lot on uh, what you've learned in the past, it depends a lot on what, what is preferred in countries or hospitals. Um, there is no better one. If you ask me personally, I have a slight preference for the DPOE, but that is because it allows me to play a little bit with it and uh, you, you can do all kind of nice things by setting it up for measuring the different frequencies. But, but uh, otherwise, uh, uh, let yourself guide by what the people around you prefer. We are getting to the end of this uh, pre presentation, which means uh, that it is time for questions. So if there is any questions, if you want me to elaborate more on certain aspects, or if you want me to go back to the software and show a few things, please let me know. Ah, let's see. If you have the same pass criteria set up, can you get a pass on the DPOE and a field on the TOE, or is that not possible? Well, a very easy answer is everything is possible. Um, we are dealing with two different technologies, and particularly factors like noise can have a different impact on the DPOE versus the TEOE measurement. So if it is noisy, you could say, I do expect the DPOE to generate a pass more easily than a TEOE. Now, if we go to the very quiet situation, um, no, no noise, or we can measure until the noise is very low, then still, due to the differences in technology, one could do better than the other one. Um, uh, maybe it's a little bit dangerous to predict if, if one is better than the other one, but but my personal experience is that the TEOAE uh, measurement is more vulnerable for incorrect probe placements. This means that if the click is not having a nice flat character over the, all the frequencies and it's not presenting some of the frequencies that, that you include in the pass, uh, in, the pass uh, in, the, in the screening, then, then maybe it fails due to probe position where TPOE can compensate a little bit easier for such a, a, a wrong uh, positioning. And, and so, so differences can occur. Um, if, if you will do both tests and you say one is pass and the other one is refer, what should my conclusion be? If your screening protocol is strict enough and the, 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 the pass is giving you a very high confidence level. So uh, um, you can still trust that while the refer just means it's inconclusive. And this is one of the examples where in, uh, a refer doesn't necessarily mean that the ear is bad. It could be a technological reason why, why it didn't uh, pass. If both are refer, then you get a stronger feeling for maybe something is wrong. Very good question. Thank you. I hope to meet you in the next webinar. Our plan for 2015 is to have webinars every two weeks at the same time. You can always choose between Wednesday our afternoon or Thursday in the morning. And um, if, if you miss one or two that were interesting, they will all be put online so that you can uh, uh, review afterwards. Thank you for now. And goodbye.